Welcome to the Wyoming Outdoor Expo edition of Firearm Friday, Guns That Won the West. This is the 10th of 14 live events, and tonight we're going to the State Museum in Cheyenne, Wyoming to visit with firearms historian Evan Green. For the past several years, he's been working to update and expand the inventory information and the stories on the museum's collection of some 300 firearms, all with a connection or a supposed connection to Wyoming's history from her earliest beginnings. The Wyoming State Museum is in downtown Cheyenne and is free and open to the public Monday through Saturday from 9 to 4.30. But Evan is here now and ready and willing to answer your questions. So please take advantage of this opportunity. To get started, let us know where you are watching from in the comments and what firearm you feel deserves the title of the gun that won the West. We hope you'll stick around for 45 minutes or so that we'll be here. But if you need to leave early, you can always come back to the recordings or the Wyoming Game and Fish Department YouTube channel or Facebook page or wyomingexpo.com. So with that, hey, Evan. Hey, Catherine, thank you. It's a very kind introduction. Uh, and I want to welcome all the viewers to this very special edition of Firearms Friday from the State Museum in Cheyenne. And uh, I'm very pleased and honored that the folks at the uh, Game and Fish Department Outdoor Expo invited me to do one of my favorite things, which is talk about firearms and talk about Wyoming history. So as Catherine mentioned, we have about 300 firearms in the permanent collection here at the museum. And we probably have uh, a couple dozen of those firearms on display at any one time. And the rest are secured uh, in a vault where I have access when I'm doing my research on individual guns. And I found in making presentations like this in the past and, and doing our normal eight to 10 minute Firearms Friday videos, that people are really most interested in the stories that uh, are behind some of these firearms. And I think we have um, three or four good stories that we can share with you today. Um, the majority, probably the majority of the firearms, I mean, they've all got a story, right? Uh, but sometimes there's no way to find that story or no one to tell that story. But when we get lucky, as we have with a couple of the firearms we'll be discussing today, uh, and when we do our research, we can generate that story, that very interesting story that really makes, for me and hopefully for you, makes these firearms come to life. So the other thing we have to deal with is sometimes the stories aren't true. I assume that most of you will know who Tom Horn was, he was a mule packer, he was an army scout in the Southwest and the Indian campaigns there. He was a rather unsuccessful Pinkerton agent and came to Wyoming to be a stock detective to assist the large ranchers in this area deal with rustlers. And his way of dealing with the rustlers was just to kill them. So um, either intentionally or by accident, he killed the teenage son of a Wyoming sheep rancher in the Cheyenne area. A young Willie Nickel was wearing his father's coat. And Tom Horn was convicted of killing him. So Horn was tried here in Cheyenne. He escaped from jail once and was recaptured. Um, but he was hanged in Cheyenne in the fall of 1903. But one of the Colt single action army revolvers in our collection that was donated to the museum by a, a very generous individual who claimed in the documentation that he submitted with this firearm, with this handgun, was that it belonged to Tom Horn. Well, as I mentioned, Tom was hung, hanged in uh, Cheyenne in 1903. By the serial number on the firearm, we can go to the Colt records and confirm that the particular revolver was manufactured in 1907, so we really don't think it belonged to, to Tom Horn. And there are other instances of that sort where people have said, well, this is associated with this particular event in history, but the timelines just don't come together. But it's always interesting, uh, regardless of the initial uh, 
take on the story of whether it's true or not to uh, go ahead and, and, and try to either confirm or deny that particular story. So out of the 300 firearms that we have in the collection, I'm going to share with you the one that is probably my favorite. And it is also a Colt single action army revolver in caliber 3220. And we have it here. Uh, and one of the things that makes this firearm very interesting to me. Now, when this was manufactured and when it came out of the factory in the early 20th century, the barrel and ejector rod housing would have been blued, the back strap trigger guard would have been blued, the hammer and the frame would have been color case hardened. There is no trace of any of that finish on this firearm today. But, and also, these grips, they would have been checkered. These are probably gutta percha or hard rubber grips. And they eventually were, they initially were checkered. And you can see now that they're worn practically smooth. So what that means is this, this firearm, somebody loved this firearm. Somebody carried this every day as they went about their business because there's no trace of corrosion or rust is really in pristine condition for a firearm that's this old and obviously saw this much use. So who owned this firearm? Well, uh, when I did the initial research, uh, I didn't know. But my supervisor here at the museum, Jim Allison, who is supervisor of collections, double checks the work that I do. And when he looked at this particular revolver, he pulled the grips off and scratched in the back of the grips was the name Earl Hainer, Cody, Wyoming. So we did some research and discovered that Earl Hainer owned a dude ranch and outfitting business between Cody and the east interest of Yellowstone Park. And that uh, establishment is still there today as a tourist camp or, or a place that you can stay it when you're in that area. So uh, as we went into this analysis, again, of, of who was Earl Hainer and, and why would he have this firearm? What's his connection to Wyoming history? We discovered that he was a member of the posse that in March of 1939 participated in the manhunt for a guy named Earl Durand, known to the press as Tarzan of the Tetons, while well, he was nowhere near the and he wasn't really Tarzan, but they tagged him with that name. Now, he was arrested in March of 1939 for poaching elk. And um, Earl Durand was a guy born probably 100 years too late because he was the consummate mountain man. He was an excellent shot. He was capable of living off the land. Uh, he rode a horse from, uh, from Cody, Powell area where his parents had a farm. He rode a horse all the way to Mexico, living off the land and dealing with the situations as they came up. But this was an era when the Game and Fish Department was first starting to implement licensing and seasons. So Earl didn't really abide by that and was arrested for poaching a couple of elk. And he was put in jail in Cody. And while he was there, he was taunted by the jailer. He said, oh, they're going to lock you up, Earl. He would not live in his parents' farmhouse. He lived in a tent behind their house. But anyway, he was taunted by this jailer. And the jailer brought him his supper. Earl grabbed the milk bottle, beamed the jailer, uh, took his gun, uh, and made him drive to his parents' house. And the jail break was reported. And two law enforcement officers... Uh, I think said, geez, you know, crazy old Earl Duran, we got to go pick him up. So they drove out to the Duran farm, and Earl shot and killed them both. So it was not a routine uh, recapture. He subsequently disappeared into the mountains, and uh, a posse was organized out of Cody by Millward Simpson. And he was the man on the spot because the sheriff, Frank Blackburn, had taken his first vacation in many years and was in California. So Melbourne Simpson, 
who of course went on to be a senator uh, from Wyoming and the governor of Wyoming, organized this posse. And he tried to turn two guys away because they were convicted poachers. But the rumor started that there was this hefty reward for the capture of Earl Duran. So these two guys hung out with the posse and said, we're going to go get him. While they went charging up this hillside, Earl Duran shot and killed them both. <clears throat> so in the course of this manhunt, Earl eventually came off the mountain and uh, carjacked a vehicle with some people in it. Uh, went to Powell and picked up a shipment of ammunition at the post office and then went into the Powell bank to rob the bank to get getaway money. So uh, no one knows the reason why, but he started shooting inside the bank, and which of course uh, alerted uh, the townspeople who broke out their firearms. And uh, Earl tried to leave the bank behind a screen of bank employees. He had three of them tied together. They went out the front door, and a helpful citizen shot and killed the teller. And it's kind of in that same time frame. There was a 17-year-old kid across the street in a gas station. Gas station owner gave him a, a Winchester rifle, and he shot Earl Durand. And Durand made his way back into the bank and committed suicide. So, again, this handgun that we looked at, this uh, cold single action arm, belonged to Earl Hayner, who was a member of that posse in uh, 1939. So, again, a really good story. So, Catherine, you got anything to say about that one? Yes. Well, um, I, I want to tell you that we've got folks from Rock Springs to Moorcroft to Cheyenne to Wickenburg, Arizona, and uh, Tina Thornsbury's back with us from Knott County, Kentucky. Uh, so we're, we've got some folks watching from all around. Um, and I have a question. Uh, you said that uh, your supervisor pulled off the grips of that handgun and then see Earl's name. What prompts prompted him to pull off the grips? Is that was that a common is that a common thing that people would carve their uh, names in their grips or it was tell not us about that? Good. And uh, my supervisor's a really smart guy, so he had some experience with, with this uh, with this situation. And yeah, it was and again it's like you go, wow. When, when you find something like that. And the next part, other questions or comments? Comments, folks are thinking, folks are thinking this is interesting and it's a great story. And we've got folks from Greeley, Colorado and Virginia. Nice, so. very good. Okay, the next firearm we're gonna talk about has a similar uh, story in the sense that we found a name associated with the firearm that was actually carved on that firearm. So what we're looking at here is a Winchester model 1876, also known as the Centennial model, obviously for the year that it came out. And this rifle was very popular in that era because this particular one is a, a called an express rifle. It is a 50 caliber, which means that the bore diameter is a full half inch across, and um, it would use 95 grains of black powder. And what this was the most powerful repeating rifle available between uh, 1876 and uh, 18. 86 when a redesigned rifle came out. So again, this one, and when we're talking about uh, guns that won the West, you know, if you get your information uh, or your opinions about guns that won the West, um, if you got them from, from Western movies or old Western TV shows, or I understand these days there's a video game called Red Dead Redemption with Winchesters and Colts, uh, playing a prominent role, you probably think that Winchester's, Winchester lever actions and Colt revolvers were the guns that won the West. So um, I have an alternative candidate that we'll discuss here in a minute. So anyway, 
This is a very powerful rifle and in very excellent condition. Uh, bore is very, very nice. And uh, this one, I happened to uh, remove the butt plate and found that under the butt plate was the name Webb Hayes, Wyoming, 1879. So I wasn't smart enough to find out who Webb Hayes was. But one of our uh, museum staff here who does that sort of research came back in and said, wow, Webb Hayes was the second son of President Rutherford B. Hayes. And he came to Wyoming for the first time in 1879 and was accompanied on this hunting and fishing trip by General George Crook, who was a famous Civil War general, uh, very active in the Indian Wars after the Civil War. And General George Crook had been Rutherford's commanding officer during the Civil War. So in the winter, they'd go into camp and Rutherford would bring his sons out to spend some time with him in winter camp in the Union Army. Well, uh, somehow Webb and uh, General Crook hit it off and General Crook took Webb under his wing and taught him to hunt and fish and to be an outdoorsman. And they came to Wyoming pretty regularly in that period. Between 1879 was the first trip. But they came almost every year between then and when uh, General Crook passed away, I think the early uh, 1880s. But Webb considered General Crook to be his godfather. And Webb went on to have quite a career in the military. He was involved in uh, the Spanish-American War. He was uh, dispatched to the Philippines. And in the Philippines, within days of arriving, uh, he led a detachment to rescue American prisoners of war. And for that action, he was awarded the Medal of Honor. And he went on to establish the first presidential library in memory of his father, Rutherford B. Hayes. So it's kind of interesting uh, what was going on in Wyoming, going on on the frontier in 1879. Uh, accompanying, I mean, you got the president's son, right? So you just can't send him out into the bushes. So a detachment of uh, cavalry from Fort Fred Steele went as a guard for the Webb Hayes General Crook party. And the commander of that detachment was the commander of Fort Fred Steele, a guy named Thomas Thornburg. He was a major. And while they're out in what is now Carbon County, near Battle Lake, I think, um, a courier came from the fort and said, the Utes down on the reservation in what is now, would be now northern part of Colorado on the west slope, uh, the Indian agent down there, a guy named Nathan Meeker, has asked for the army to come because the natives are restless and uh, he's concerned with his own safety and the safety of his uh, employees and family on the Ute reservation. And what really upset the Utes was this was one of those situations where they're trying to convert a nomadic, free-ranging, proud people into farmers. And you probably know that that didn't go very well. And Nathan uh, Meeker really upset them when he plowed up their racetrack, which was one of their fun things, uh, to plant corn. So they were very upset with that. So Thornburg and his crew went, and at Milk Creek in what is now uh, northwestern Colorado, they encountered a contingent of uh, Utes. And one of them was, uh, and I don't, I can't pronounce or remember his native name, but he was called Captain Jack by the whites. And he said, listen, this, this is a really touchy situation. You need to just stop here with your troops and we can take two or three of you in to the reservation and we'll see if we can negotiate a peaceful settlement to this situation. Well, Thornburg had his orders, right? So he says, right, eh. crosses Milk Creek. He walks in, rides in, takes his troops into an ambush on September 29, 19, 1879. He is killed in that first encounter along with about a dozen of his troopers. 
and they were uh, under siege until October 5th. In the meantime, there was a contingent from Fort Lewis, Colorado, of the 9th Cavalry, and those were the Buffalo Soldiers, right? So they were able to break through the Indian lines and reinforce what remained of Thornburg's command. But they were not able to uh, break free from that encirclement until a detachment of troops from uh, Fort D.A. Russell here in Cheyenne got on the train, took the train to Fort Steele, marched south, rode south, and relieved that group. But on that day, September 29, 1879, Nathan Meeker and 10 of his white employees were killed by the Utes, and his wife and daughter were kidnapped and not recovered for some uh, period of time, a couple of weeks, before they were released. So, really neat rifle, very powerful gun for the time, uh, very popular. Theodore Roosevelt had two of them that he was very fond of. There's a great picture of him looking really stern, holding a Winchester 1879 rifle. When Geronimo surrendered, one of the last of the Indians uh, to actually be taken into uh, American custody, one of the rifle that he surrendered, when he, when he surrendered, he gave up his Winchester model 1879. So, really sweet gun. So again, we think that uh, when we think of the guns that won the West, we say, okay, is it uh, Winchester lever actions, John Wayne out of time at a Winchester model 1892, even when he was supposed to be in the 1860s and 70s. So was it the Winchester or was it the Colt revolver that won the West? Smith and Wesson revolvers were out there. Certainly Sharps firearms were very popular on the frontier, large heavy caliber, very heavy rifle. We have some upstairs that weigh 18 pounds. And they were the rifles that the Buffalo Hunters used to, to basically wipe out the American bison. So you also had in 1873, the Trapdoor Springfield, which became the issue long gun to the uh, cavalry and carbine form and to the infantry and rifle form. And uh, George Custer's men in the 7th Cavalry were armed with 1873 trapdoor Springfields at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. So didn't do a whole lot of good. So thinking of guns that won the West. Before I go further, Catherine, what's up? We've got some questions, and you have alluded to some of the answers, but I'm going to ask them uh, officially and outright. Uh, John Scott asks, how heavy is that rifle, and would you want to carry it all day? Now, it doesn't sound like it's 18 pounds, but sounds like it might be heavy. Yeah, I, I'm just guessing. I would guess it's probably 10 or 11 pounds. Um, heavier than what a modern sporting rifle probably would be. Um, so I'm guessing 11 to 12 pounds. Okay. And, hold me to that one. Okay. And then you mentioned uh, hunting bison. Uh, what other uh, animals might they have been hunting in Wyoming? Uh, and I'll add, how close would one have to get uh, for a shot uh, with one of these Winchesters? Um, the, the Hayes Crook expeditions focused mainly on, on elk, which were a plains animal at that time, uh, antelope, uh, mule deer, uh, bighorn sheep, uh, and they went fishing. On this first expedition, when Thornburg went out with them, they reported that Thornburg caught like 300 trout in an hour. So they were fishing and hunting. As far as range, um, with this particular rifle, if you were a really good shot, I suppose that you could be pretty effective out to 300, 400 yards. I would not take a shot that long, but then my eyes are bad. And the Sharps rifles were, were very accurate. There was a famous incident where a guy named Billy Dixon was involved in the fight at Adobe Walls. This was an encampment of buffalo hunters in the north part of Texas. And they were forted up in this old uh, area that had been had Adobe buildings. There was a bunch of them in there. 
and they were attacked by uh, Comanches, and I think maybe, probably not Sioux, but Comanches, because the, the leader of the Comanches at that time was uh, Parker, Quana Parker, who was the, uh, I'm not sure that's the correct issue. His mother was uh, Cynthia Ann Parker, who had been captured and taken back to the tribe and subsequently became uh, uh, the wife of a Comanche and her son was Quana Parker. So anyway, the, the Apaches came in, the guys there, the Buffalo hunters forded up and uh, basically held them off, although it was quite a vigorous battle at the time. And at kind of at the end of it, when they think, thought they'd run the, the Indians off, uh, they looked up and they could see on that bluff way over there, there's an Indian on a horse. So Billy Dixon borrowed a sharp's rifle and uh, shot and uh, hit that Indian. And I think he would be the first to uh, agree that it was probably a little bit of luck, maybe a lot of luck. But they have since uh, replicated that distance and that shot, and it was close to a mile. That, I mean, the, the trajectory of the old heavy slow bullet had to look like a rainbow. But he made that shot at over a thousand yards, something like seventeen hundred yards. Oh wow! All right. Well, we've got some more questions. Um, but I'm going to ask one of them now, and then we're going to let you get on to our next firearm. Um, Sean P. on uh, YouTube is wondering about thoughts on the show field. Oh, OK. Um, well, it was an interesting firearm. It was a, a, an improvement over the uh, Smith & Wesson American Number no. 3, which was uh, for the Colt to unload, to load and unload a Colt revolver, you had to open this loading gate. You had to put the hammer on half cock. This won't hold on half cock, the sear is damaged. But you would put, the, put it on half cock so the cylinder would turn. You would load the cartridges one at a time. And then when you had fired all those cartridges, you had to reverse that procedure and use this ejector rod under the barrel here to eject the uh, fired cartridges one at a time. So it was a fairly slow process. The Smith & Wesson number no. three, which was the progenitor and predecessor of the Schofield, was a break open revolver. And when you broke that thing open, it ejected all the empties at one shot. And you could load, reload there. So Schofield, his brother, I, I forget names, but the older brother of the guy who invented the Schofield uh, was in the ordnance department. So the Schofield revolver guy really hoped that this would get adopted by the Army. And the, the, it was an improvement over the, the Smith & Wesson number no. 3. For that one, it took two hands. You had to hold it in one hand, pull up this latch to eject the cartridges. The Schofield you could push that up with your thumb, break it against your, your saddle or your, or your leg to open it. So it was a one-hand operation. So if you're riding a horse, you could operate and eject the empties out of that revolver with one hand. And that was the improvement. That was a Schofield improvement over the Smith & Wesson number no. 3 revolver. Now, Smith & Wesson, unfortunately, did not chamber the Schofield for the standard Army cartridge which was the 45 Colt, which was just a silly millimeter longer than the Schofield cartridge, 45 Schofield. So you immediately had this logistic problem in the service of having two different firearms and two different ammunition needs. And having been in the military back in the Dark Ages, uh, if the Army can screw up, they will, so you know that at some point, the guys armed with Schofields got 45 Colt ammunition. Worked okay the other way because the 45 Schofield cartridge would load into the single action army revolver one at a time. So the Schofield was a great improvement, but because of those logistic issues, um, it was discontinued and most of the army issue Schofields were sold off to Wells Fargo. The barrels were cut to five inches 
and sold at Wells Fargo. And we have a documented Wells Fargo Schofield in the museum's collection. Interesting. All right. Well, I'm going to let you get, get on to the next gun that uh, won the West. Okay. Um, so I started sort of talking about what's the gun that won the West. And we talked about the Colt revolver. We talked about um, the Winchester lever action rifle, Sharps rifles. But, you know, the Colt single action revolver, uh, Colt patented his first cap and ball revolver, the Colt Patterson, in 1836. The first rifle to carry the Winchester name was the 1866 Winchester brass frame lever action rifle, uh, kind of an improvement on the Henry rifle, which saw some use in the Civil War. But when, when was the West won? the historian Frederick Jackson Turner issued an opinion in the mid-1890s based on the 1890 census that there was no longer a demarcation line that created a frontier, that that frontier had basically reached the West Coast, reached the California settlements and the Pacific Northwest. And so if we take arbitrarily uh, 1890, 1895, 1896, as uh, the West is one. I mean, there were certainly isolated, uh, still Indian uh, issues and uh, bandits and bad guys. But basically, if we take that as the time that the uh, West was won, then the Winchester rifle was in use for about 60 years, or the Colt was in, in operation or in use about 60 years. Winchester, uh, maybe 30 to 35 years before the West was won. So let's talk about a firearm that was in use in the American West for roughly uh, 300 years. This is a what's called a Northwest trade rifle or musket, actually. It is a smooth bore cap and ball or black powder and ball firearm that was first introduced into the fur trade in North America uh, about the time that the flintlock ignition system was invented, so say 1630 to 1640. And these rifle muskets became very popular as trade items. And uh, in uh, by the mid 1700s, obtain one of these uh, trade muskets, uh, you had to have 10 beaver pelts and a lesser amount for to acquire powder, to acquire uh, lead. So this was, again, introduced in the mid-1600s. And as late as 1936, these firearms in percussion ignition systems were still carried in inventory at the Winnipeg uh, store of the Hudson Bay Company and anecdotal evidence that they were still in use. So why were these so popular? Well, it's a very versatile firearm. It's very light. It, uh, somebody asked about the weight of that Winchester. This is probably seven, eight pounds. It's not very heavy at all. Uh, and it's very versatile. Because it is a smooth bore, you can load it with a round ball and a charge of powder and use it on big game. Or you can load it with black powder and birdshot, uh, small diameter projectiles, and use it for small game, rabbits, grouse, ducks, geese. So it's very versatile. Or you can load it with uh, a combination of buckshot, larger diameter pellets, See a load called buck and ball, so you put ball and some buckshot in there, and it was uh, pretty effective as an anti-personnel round. So it's very versatile, and these became, again, a standard item of trade in use on the frontier uh, for a period of over 300 years, or about 300 years. This one is a flintlock. It is stamped on the back here, 1825. And there were several defining features of these, these muskets. One was this 
extra large uh, trigger guard, and it's called a mitten guard. And the theory was that you could cock this, and if it was cold outside, you could pull the trigger with your gloves or your mittens. So that's one theory. The other theory is that since its use was directed towards the Native Americans, they were used to pulling their bowstring with two or three fingers, and this extra large trigger guard allowed them to get two or more fingers in on that trigger. The other defining characteristic is this side plate. It's very common uh, almost on all of these, and it is a serpent, a sea serpent, or a snake, or a dragon. And uh, all of these trade rifles, the Indians would not accept one that didn't have that particular uh, side plate opposite the lock. Now, this one is interesting because it has these brass tacks. There's a couple here on the top tang. There are some on the front. Um, on the front of the, of the forearm and a cross pattern on the, uh, on the buttstock. So that sort of brass tack decoration was very popular with Native Americans. Now, we can't confirm that this was a Native American firearm, but uh, there was lots of them out there. By the, eight, by the 1750s, there were, there were, uh, these were found uh, in the hands of Indians in New Mexico. When Lewis and Clark made their transcontinental journey in 1804 and 1805, they reported that they found this type of firearm in use by the Native Americans, basically the whole way across the country. So interesting, interesting firearm. And again, very versatile. And uh, even in the early 20th century, uh, late 19th century, early 20th century, people on farms, uh, settlers, homesteaders, didn't have a lot of money. Colt, uh, Colts were expensive. Winchester repeaters were expensive. You could buy a single barrel shotgun, either a muzzle loader or later on a cartridge single barrel shotgun that had the same advantages that I've just discussed. You could, you could put a slug in it and, and shoot a deer or an elk or a bear. Uh, you could load it with bird shot and, uh, and shoot grouse or squirrels or rabbits. So uh, very, very versatile firearm. Even today, uh, if I could, if I was heaven forbid, reduced to having only one gun for all purposes, hunting, uh, home defense, uh, recreational shooting, probably a shotgun, because they are a very versatile firearm. And these are so cool. I'm going to show you one other one just because it happens to be uh, my supervisor. This is his favorite gun of all the stuff we've got in the museum. And he likes this one very much because it was obviously used hard and put away wet. There's a, a hole here. The stock has been broken and repaired. It was originally as long as that first uh, one that I showed you, which probably has close to a 30 inch barrel. So this has been cut off. Uh, there's evidence here based on this heavy corrosion around the lock that at one point it was a flint lock, but has been converted after 1820 or 1830 it was converted to a percussion ignition system. So, okay, that's my candidate for the gun that won the West. Uh, Northwest right. trade rifle, musket. Uh, right, okay, and Northwest was where? Well, Northwest in those days was maybe Ohio, Western Pennsylvania, Illinois. Yeah, neat. All right, well, we've got some more questions for you. Evan. Um, let's start with Chris Powell from Facebook. He asks, uh, or maybe she, uh, was there a standard issue firearm for lawmen or would they just use whatever they personally owned and preferred? There was not a standard issue firearm. Uh, in, the, in the 19th century, uh, Colt, obviously the Colt single action was very popular. Uh, the Smith & Wesson was favored by some because of its uh, ease of loading and unloading. The first instance of standardized issue of a handgun to a law enforcement agency 
was right around the turn of the century when Theodore Roosevelt was the police commissioner in New York. And he standardized their firearms, their handguns, with Colt 32 caliber revolvers. So as far as, as far as I know, that was at least one of the first instances where there was a standardized handgun issued to a law enforcement agency. All right. We've got a question about shooting contests. And since I know, Evan, you've won a few in your day. And um, for those that don't know, Evan was the uh, Wyoming State Champion in Cowboy Action Shooting in 1999. Uh, but uh, Jerry Long asks from Facebook, what were some of the shooting contests like back then? Not an area of my expertise, so I only uh, have some anecdotal information. I know, I know one of the things that they did was a, a turkey shoot using live turkeys. Uh, they would put the turkey in a crate so that only its head was exposed, and then everybody would take turns shooting at the turkey's head, and whoever killed the turkey got to take it home for dinner. Um, I assume that there were other uh, informal competitions. Um, I'm trying to think of the name. There was a, a on the East Coast. There were there were target shooting competitions, and the name uh, the name of that particular event escapes me. But they shot both muzzle loading and cartridge firearms at varying distances and with, with incredible accuracy. That would be, that's remarkable even today with modern firearms and modern optical sights. They did amazing shooting. I can't, can't bring that, the name of that competition. There was also one in England that was a famous, uh, in the late uh, 19th century, early 20th century, but I can't, I can't think of the no, name. All right, that's interesting. All right, John Scott from Facebook is wondering who made all of the trade rifles? Um, geez, I might have to get out my glasses. Most of them, the popular ones were made in England. Um, I can't, I'm sorry, I can't think of the name. There were two competing firms in England that made trade muskets. Uh, there were also knockoffs made, which uh, were not as popular on the frontier because of some failures of the firearm. That, so Belgium was making, uh, making some trade rifles as well. But the majority of the really good ones were made by, by outfits in, in England. Okay. And we have a question from YouTube. What was the most powerful rifle in the West at that time? I would say it was probably a Sharps rifle. They also were available in a 50 caliber. And these are cartridge rifles after about 1873, the Sharps uh, sporting rifle was a cartridge rifle. So they had, uh, they had 50 calibers, and some of them were designated by the length of the cartridge case. So they had uh, 50 by two and a half, 50 by three, and those were, those were uh, very powerful rifles and probably the most powerful because they had a very sturdy breech. The problem with that 1876 Winchester is it had what was called a toggle link action. So it was not a very strong action, which was, uh, that issue was solved by John Browning who designed the Winchester 1886. But the 76 was what's called a toggle action. So it just flexed. So uh, they were really pushing the envelope with that 50 95 Express rifle. But the Sharps, definitely the most powerful. And that's one of the reasons they weighed 18 pounds, because if you're going to shoot that thing all day, you want a heavy rifle that will absorb some of that recoil, killing hundreds of buffalo a day sometimes. All right. Great. Well, I've got one last question for you, and that is, what is your favorite firearm in the museum's collection? Well, uh, God, I like them all, you know. <laughs> I find something to like with most of them, but I would have to say that it's that Hainer Colt. And again, because 
it was it was a firearm that was loved. It was a firearm that was carried every day to have that amount of wear, uh, and was well taken care of because no rust, no corrosion, no pits, no nothing. And you know we've got we've got firearms in the collection that rusted wrecks that people didn't take care of. But you know I like I said I've been uh, firearms have been my hobby for seventy years and my passion for almost that long. So, uh, yeah, I would say it's that classic Colt single action revolver and the Hainer Colt in particular. Yeah. Well, Evan, thank you for taking your time to be with us tonight. This has been, wow, it's fascinating. Um, and I love hearing about why you like that Colt. Um, in some of our sessions earlier today, people were talking about their jobs and they were outdoors or um, working with animals, but the thing that we like the most is when it connects to people um, and you can understand the story and how uh, people appreciated and used or use the resource, the gun or the uh, or our wildlife. So thank it's you. Certainly um, part of my uh, attraction to that particular revolver is that I know who owned it. I've seen his picture. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's that personal connection. Yep, absolutely. Uh, yep. All right. Well, yes, and Pat Lewis says thanks, Evan. So um, thank you. Uh, and folks at home, we have dropped a link to an evaluation in the comments section, which we would appreciate you taking a minute or two to fill that out. Um, and if you do, we have uh, this beautiful limited edition collectible cutthroat trout and pronghorn sticker that um, we will send for you and uh, enough for you and all of your family. And also thanks to our partners at Onyx Hunt. Next week, we can, we'll email you a special discount code for three months free for reading that form. Uh, and we have another code to start your summer off, right? If you'd rather have 20% off your subscription to Onyx Hunt, enter code WYLD20, WILD20 at checkout. And not only will you get 20% off, Onyx will also send $5 to the Wildlife Fund. Um, our next event is a 9 a.m. tomorrow morning, Hunt Like a Pro, uh, application tips, strategies, and hunt planning with my colleagues here at Game and Fish. And we hope to see you there. Um, just one more reminder, the Wyoming State Museum is free and open to the public Mondays through Saturdays from 9 to 4.30, so stop by. There's uh, firearms on display at all times, so um, al along with many other things as well. Um, if For more information about Expo or to watch our previously recorded events, go to wyomingexpo.com, click on Expo Live. That is it, Evan. We appreciate it, you and everybody. You're getting lots of wonderful kudos in the comp and the comments. So thank you so much, and have a good evening.